Today on Seculo, Jack Smith calls on the Supreme Court to reject presidential immunity claim. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, welcome to Seculo. We are taking your calls. 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. In 16 days, on the 25th, the Supreme Court will hear another case involving a presidential power, presidential immunity. Uh, this is uh, not the first time, but I think you know after the ones we've done, too, this is like the fourth time that the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court will hear a case involving President Trump and immunity. This time it's criminal immunity, and it's involving both official acts as president and unofficial acts. And this is a quote we've pulled. This is from page 9 of Jack Smith's brief that we find where the federal government is looking to expand this uh, ability to bring lawsuits against former presidents to a point where, you know, we said, remember, in uh, the lower court in D.C., we were concerned about that appeals court basically saying that presidents lose all of their immunity the moment they're no longer president. And you think, wow, so you have this, you have, you have CIA black ops that are not even you know, written down on paper, where we know that there are technically laws being violated. I mean, that's why they, they are off book, but yet they're funded by the government. Everybody knows these exist. Could you prosecute if you found out one of those that went wrong? Like you tar mistargeted uh, an Al Zahiri and you killed an American citizen and a minor, which Barack Obama did. Could he then be prosecuted? I mean, I don't. I don't believe so. I don't think that's what the authors of our Constitution. I don't think that the authors of these congressional laws would think that kind of law should be applying to a president of the United States during a valid act that may have gone wrong, because you could imagine as president how many valid decisions you make that are tough that don't always turn out right. It doesn't mean they're always policy decisions that you would support or that you like, but they are still policy decisions. And the, as the idea is, can you actually prosecute them for that? So what Jack Smith is asking here is, quote, a former president is subject to federal criminal prosecution for personal and official acts that violate valid criminal laws. Now, if you don't put any limit there, I mean, where, where is the limit? I mean, the president declaring war, then war kills people. War kills civilians. There are civilian casualties. Killing people who aren't a legitimate combatants can be a crime. What about suspending habeas corpus in the United States if you're Abraham Lincoln? Can you be prosecuted? I mean, th think about all of these different situations, declaring martial law post 9-11 putting the military on the streets of Washington, D.C. and New York. Uh, I don't believe there was any act of Congress to do that. I believe it was just done. Uh, later, there may have been act of Congress. These are decisions the president has to make quickly that, again, um, may, val may, again, violate some law, but yet we, we kind of, like, let those laws be superseded by the need for, by only one person in the United States, and that's the president of the United States. That would still cover... If you're doing anything personal that's criminal or unofficial that's criminal. But you know what their problem is here is ensuring that an election was valid, even though they believe Donald Trump was crazy for saying it wasn't. Ensuring an election was valid would, would fall under an official act of the president, Logan. And that's why they have to be so broad that basically you could start prosecuting presidents for decisions and policy you don't like if it didn't go perfectly. Absolutely. We have a question for you. If you're on YouTube right now, it's a poll. But if you're not, or if you want to call in, I'd love to hear from you. And that's, do you think the Supreme Court will reject Trump's claim of immunity? I want to hear from you. What do you think? Vote in that poll right now. A lot of you have already. Hundreds have already. But go ahead and vote. But give us a call. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this and on the topic at hand. Right now, we are in the middle of our Life and Liberty Drive. The work, for, the work does not stop. Right now, the Life and Liberty Drive, about halfway through... For the month of April. Can't believe we're already there. We're going to continue this discussion coming up of why you should become not only a supporter, but ACLJ champion. And right now we have a special offer for those who are ACLJ champions. That's you get a special ACLJ champions edition prayer guide. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. The prayer guide's been going great, but we have a new one just for champions. We'll be right back. 
And a brand new filing that we are just getting our hands on tonight. The special counsel, Jack Smith, is calling on the Supreme Court to reject Trump's claim of absolute immunity. Prosecutors are going to be making their case about this in person, face to face with the justices in just over two weeks from tonight. But right now, Smith is giving us a preview of his argument. And he says, and I'm quoting him here, the closest historical analog is President Nixon's official conduct in Watergate and his acceptance of a pardon implied his and President Ford's recognition that a former president was subject to prosecution. Prosecutors stated that, quote, the president's constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed does not entail a general right to violate them. Special counsel Jack Smith says there's nothing in American history, the Constitution, or even policy debate to suggest that a former president cannot be held criminally accountable, that no president has ever been prosecuted before, is not because he's immune. Jack Smith says it reflects the unprecedented nature of Trump's alleged conduct. Some of these arguments we've seen before, right? This is the third time that the special counsel's office is briefing this issue of presidential immunity before federal courts in this federal election interference case before Judge Chutkin. But for the first time, they are encountering a Supreme Court that could side with Donald Trump on more than one issue here or more than one sub part of what's being decided. And so you see, starting at page eight, them make a sort of new argument that even if the court holds, and I'm reading from the brief here, that a former mm -hmm. president is entitled to some immunity from criminal prosecution for official acts, that principle does not preclude trial on this indictment. Now, one thing the Supreme Court could do that would slow this down quite a bit is they could actually send that question back to Judge Chutkin to rule on at the district court level, setting off yet another wave of decisions and potential appeals. All right, so we're asking you, because it will be at the Supreme Court, these, these are interesting questions the Supreme Court usually doesn't like. Uh, for instance, how far does presidential immunity go? They had to answer that a few times under President Trump. This time they're having to figure it out as a former president. Now, the interesting thing is the former president who might be president again uh, is subject to, are they subject to federal criminal prosecution for both personal acts that violate criminal laws and official acts that violate criminal laws? And that is a, a main uh, question. Jack Smith and Department of Justice are asserting that the president can, uh, uh, and a former president can be, uh, prosecuted for these official acts that violate valid criminal laws. I want to go to Harry Hutchinson on this because, Harry, the question is there's nothing limiting that. There's not a discussion about all the things we just went through of decisions presidents have to make that, uh, again, whether it's a CIA operations that may violate international laws, U.S. laws, uh, targeted assassinations we know that were carried out by Suleimani, sometimes those violate laws that are on uh, various international uh, laws as well, maybe even U.S. laws. I mean, it's it's not like the U.S. I'm not saying the president every day is violating you know laws, but certainly through their official acts, they uh, there is a one person in the United States that is able to take actions kind of outside of the regular legal system, and that happens to be the president of the United States who can send troops to war for 90 days, you know, without getting congressional authorization. You're absolutely correct. So Jack Smith offers an extraordinarily broad claim denying presidential immunity. Essentially, Jack Smith wants to criminalize and offer up for prosecution virtually any act entered into by the president of the United States. So, for instance, in 2011, uh, President Obama uh, issued a drone policy which led to the killing of an American citizen, um, Anwar Alawaki, on October the 20th, on the October the 14th, 2011. That was a drone strike, and arguably, if Jack Smith is correct, we could now prosecute President Obama. Similarly, President Obama ordered the extrajudicial killing of Osama bin Laden. I am sure that some international law was breached by that activity, although it was supported, I would submit, by the majority of American people. 
So there has to be, in my judgment, some limitation placed on Jack Smith's very broad theory. Presidents are entitled uh, to engage in acts that are designed to ensure the effective functioning of the executive branch. Jack Smith wants to take that right away, and I think the Supreme Court should deny it. It's interesting. A lot of comments are going through, and a lot of them are about Jack Smith's power in this. Yep. And how does someone essentially get this much power in this kind of position? Well, I mean, he's a special prosecutor, so he doesn't get to make this decision. He's asking the court to decide. So he's been a, he's been a he's been at the Department of Justice before, heads of divisions before. He's also been at the International uh, Criminal Court before as a special prosecutor there, inv- investigating war crimes. Uh, he he his he's the one who brought the charges against Bob McDonald. He's a lifer when it comes to political cases. So this is kind of like in his wheelhouse. That doesn't mean though he's not the judge. He's also not the jury. So he doesn't get to decide. He's putting the case forward. He's putting the argument forward. It's not giving him the power to say the president uh, can be prosecuted for official acts that violate criminal law if they're the former president. Um, he's saying they should be, and he's putting that forward to the U.S. Supreme Court, who can ultimately make a decision on that. So people like Jack Smith get appointed to these positions as special counsel. Um, they are usually pe- special counsels are, are individuals like Mueller, who served at high levels of the Department of Justice, maybe in private practice now or are no longer with um, uh, the federal government, who then uh, get recruited to take on these special cases. I think it's a waste. I think we spend tons of money on the Department of Justice. They got plenty of attorneys, and they, they, these attorneys shouldn't have a problem uh, putting aside uh, their conflicts of interest over the administration. They should be able to look at these cases and without having to have a special counsel that has to have its own budget. But this was kind of a intermittent play. We used to have an independent counsel, Logan, which was set up by Congress. That was what Ken Starr was. That that has been uh, no longer approved, so you don't have those anymore. And they would kind of run around and be able to – have this uh, subpoena power that was outside of the presidential appointment system. Jack Smith, for all intents and purposes, even as a special counsel, could be fired by the attorney general, could be fired by the president of the United States. They are not, though they they have, they are supposed to have more independence. Uh, In truth, they aren't. It's fun to watch the comments now, people kind of getting a better grip on how that all works we would love to hear from you at 1-800-684-3110 it's a great time to call what do you think the supreme court will do here after hearing what's going on with jack smith i'd love to hear from you 1-800-684-3110 yeah again we're taking your calls at 1-800-684-3110 i mean harry there's a there's a way jack smith that that the what i think the reason they're having to argue this is because the baseline of what they're up the charges on president trump were that the election was invalid and the president of the United States certainly has a valid um, interest, so it would be an official act that was valid to some extent in ensuring that the election was fair, that the election laws were followed. I mean, certainly a president has that. When does it cross over a line to, uh, is it some criminal act to question that? That, to me, is a very difficult line for the Supreme Court to draw. I think that is precisely correct and i think the line is arguably fact specific and so the appropriate remedy in this case i think is for the supreme court to send the case back to the trial court for initial adjudication on the issue of immunity and then allow that particular issue to be litigated up through the appellate courts and perhaps back up to the supreme court once we have a factual record on the ground. That's number one. Number two, I would argue that the position that the ACLJ has taken, which is a middle course, uh, is, uh, is the best approach. In other words, the president should be immunized with respect to official acts designed to further the enforcement of the law. He has an obligation under the Constitution to make sure that the executive branch uh, functions effectively. And so uh, Jack Smith, in my judgment, has taken a very extreme position, and he's taken an extreme position in prior cases, and some might argue that he seeks to usher in what might be called a reign of terror by special counsel prosecutors 
were political disagreements. And that was the outcome of the Bob McDonnell case. The Supreme Court issued an opinion 9-0 against Jack Smith. So Jack Smith has a distinguished reputation of overreaching. And so I think he's overreaching in this particular case as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it could be, uh, again, this this idea, the Heritage Foundation put up, Harry, and again, we've had a special cause. We had Mueller, who was also a private citizen and appointed, but they have this idea that, uh, and I, I'm not sure, again, it's an idea to discuss. I don't think it doesn't stop anything here, and the courts have obviously accepted special uh, counsels, but they say that they don't believe that Garland or the AGs have the powers to appoint these individuals because they're private citizens now, and that's like appointing a private citizen to have this extraordinary a criminal law enforcement power under the special counsel statute. I mean, they are usually former DOJ and usually like right out of DOJ. So I don't know if they would just to get around that, they would just swear them right in. But what do you think? Well, I think um, the Heritage Foundation is onto something that we should limit yeah. the appointment of special counsels and we su- should subject the appointment to some type of scrutiny beyond the attorney general's purview. Uh, if they're going to have special powers. Keep in mind, Jack Smith is prosecuting Trump in Florida, uh, in Washington, D.C. Right. Uh, and I'm sure if he, he could find a case, he would be prosecuting Trump in Georgia or Nebraska. And, right. and I just think that's too much power in the hands of one individual. Yeah, and usually, I mean, again, it runs right through the attorney general's office, and the deputy attorney general is usually in charge of kind of running the operation uh, for the special counsel. Yep, and we are in the middle of our Life and Liberty Drive. No, Timothy's on uh, hold right now. Timothy, we'll get to your question right up front in the next segment here, but we only have a minute till we go to break, and I want to tell you our work for fighting for life and liberty, it never, ever ends, and your gifts are crucial to support that legal work right now. The month, This month, your gifts will be doubled through our Life and Liberty Drive at ACLJ.org. You've heard all of what's been going on here. We just filed a lawsuit against a school that's banning Christian teachers from even appearing to pray. You're going to hear a report in the next segment about a city that said there's a no church zone, what we did to urgently fix that. But also we urgently need your support. And today you can be a part of our ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. And if you become an ACLJ champion, that's someone who decides they would like to give on a monthly recurring basis. We are going to provide you the special ACLJ champion prayer guide. We've already seen amazing amazing success and results and prayers coming from our ACLJ prayer guide and the champions prayer guide is just a new version that gets you a little more in depth into the battles we fight globally so do that now go to aclj.org have your have your gifts doubled we'll be right back article out by the IRS right around you know the tax season in April and we've warned about this throughout the inflation reduction act that it was about you know they were always about about the one percent and and uh, the, the, the most wealthy were going to be who the IRS wanted to target. But the truth is the most wealthy have attorneys and accountants putting together all their tax returns and extensions and things like that. And we said it's going to be the middle class. And now the Wall Street Journal's got the issue. Uh, we know that as of last summer, 63% of new audits targeted taxpayers with income of less than $200,000 right at the middle class. The IRS has promised and pledged that, the audits would target the wealthy. Uh, But we also know now that the audits that have taken place so far have disproportionately targeted uh, the middle class. And so you're precisely correct. As of last summer, 63% of new audits targeted taxpayers with income of less than $200,000. The only good news, I think, in the report is that the revenue agents that they've been able to recruit has fallen way short of their objective. In other words, they've only been able to hire 34 agents, according to the Wall Street Journal, in the first six months of this so-called expansionary phase, even though the IRS goal was 3,700. So, What should the American people do in response to all of this? Uh, They should be energized to claw back the more than $80 billion that the Democrats have funneled in this uh, tax enforcement scheme. 
that disproportionately targets the middle class. To secular, I want to go to Timothy's call from South Dakota on line two, talking about Jack Smith. Timothy, welcome to Seculo. You're on the air. Yeah, I'm just curious about who gave him the authorization, or what is he really a special counsel, yeah. or is this something he just so special just... counsel's office is within the Department of Justice. He's appointed by Merrick Garland, who was appointed by the President of the United States. There was also a special counsel appointed to investigate um, Joe Biden. Remember, he he resigned and then. After he issued his report, he testified Robert Hurt to Congress, and he was the one that said Joe Biden would be impossible to prosecute because if you put him on the stand, in his famous words, he said he's going to look like a confused grandpa, and that's going to be very difficult to get a guilty verdict on having pieces of paper that he should have had. Um, but then again, if you're if you're uh, if you are, I think if you're Jack Smith, you think President Trump, you're thinking the exact opposite kind of person on uh, that same age, close to the same age but the, a very different person who brings out a very different feeling from uh, jurors. And, and uh, so that was a special counsel as well. It's part of the code of the Department of Justice. Uh, you can look it up. It's different than an independent counsel. It's not, auth- it's not a congressional authorized role. It is a, an executive branch uh, decision when they believe a case should be kind of outside their purview in the sense that they're not in full control but also still with inside their purview in the sense that it's usually former DOJ officials who are running these investigations like any other DOJ, DOJ investigation. The difference is like what Harry pointed out is they get you know, nationwide jurisdiction and issues like that. 1-800-684-3110. If you've got more questions about that, you can give us a call at 1-800-684-3110. But we do have as well a new case and a victory. This all happened you know, within a few days, and and I want to go to CC Hall on this because CC, uh, we got uh, contacted by a church in in uh, Hertford, North Carolina, that was told there are districts within their city that are quote no church zone. So this new church, they're ready to start looking for land to Let's buy a building. There, yeah. yeah, so it's a new church, <laughs> and they want to buy, a, they want to build a building. So right. they're going to find land in the community they want to build in, and then they find out in the community that they want to build in, there's literally. Maybe there's land that they want, but it's a no church zone. Explain that to people. Right. And that's actually exactly what the manager, town manager said, that there literally are no church zones. And these no church zones are actually the commercial districts where they do allow similar uses for libraries, museums, theaters, art galleries and restaurants, but specifically deny any use to the churches. So we had a client contact us, a church that wants to uh, get a building and start a church there and saying, basically, we cannot do that. And what made matters worse is even in the zones where they do allow churches, they only allow them if you get a conditional use permit. So never as a right does a church have just a right by zoning laws to build a church or to start a church. So in our federal laws, we do a lot of these cases called RELUPA cases, a federal law specifically in place to protect places of worship from these types of laws. So we sent in a demand letter, but they did not res- respond. They were supposed to respond by April 3rd. And so we were preparing to go to court on this, and uh, lo and behold, we last night the yes. city does respond. Tell, city tell, tell everybody what happened with, and, and what they told the That's ACLJ. Right. We sent a demand letter pointing out that they are vital- violating the First Amendment and, like you said, our LUPA, which is the Religious uh, Land Use Act. Um, so it's the Constitution and federal law that they are violating and then at about 9 o'clock last night, we did receive a letter um, from the town saying that they are going to propose an amendment to their current zoning ordinance that will allow churches to operate as a permitted use under the same circumstances and regulations as other comparable um, permitted uses. So that was a, a very good victory and in a short amount of time. And that shows how, you know, we can we can jump in on these cases and um, let these towns know and these cities know this is what the law is, and they they usually comply and they want to do what's right. And here we have that same victory. But we still see in the law, in the legal system, if the, we don't correct it, that you've got you know a library, an art gallery, all these others that even, would they would register as nonprofits. Yeah, how did it even so get there? So they're not there? paying property taxes, but yet right. inside the law they say, you know what? Let's call out places of worship and let's not allow churches. 
Right. And then if we are going to allow the churches, we'll have to approve them. So that's going to get into a whole issue of government entanglement. I mean, that's the, the people who say, like, you know, the, the government shouldn't be involved in religion. That's what we're talking about. Exactly. The government should not be deciding which church gets to build and which uh, or which synagogue gets to be there. Right. And they're literally prohibiting the free exercise. So they're directly violating the First Amendment. And again, like you said, federal law. And they're doing it on its face. I mean, it was on its face. It's not even as applied. We, you can read it and see that there are no churches allowed. Now we have we determined as long as they follow what they have said, yes. um, without having to go to court, our client, this church, should be able to purchase property in Hartford and that they are going to change, and we'll make sure they do, to change the language inside their laws so that um, – another church or religious group never faces this action again. That's right. So now we've protected, since they're going to actually amend their zoning laws, we have protected every church going forward as well. And, and this is, again, it's a great example of people utilizing ACLJ.org slash help. Because you might think, Logan, like, oh, this is too small. Or, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's settled law. There's, they, or, that hey, says there's no. a law on this, so maybe I can't fight this. And, yeah. Or if I do fight this, this is going to take 20 years in court because they wrote this law in, yeah. in 1900. And the truth is, you can get these settled within, let's see, was it March 25th? March 25th. To yeah. April 9th. That's correct. Done. So less than, what, two weeks? I mean, it's Less pretty... than two weeks, you get a victory from the ACLJ. It doesn't cost you a thing. And now that church is going to be able to find property in the city that it wanted, buy that property, and build their church. Yeah, and this is the time, and we're going to talk about this coming up here in uh, just a few minutes, um, a time when churches are maybe some of the most vulnerable that they've ever been. So you, when you have security issues, when you have... Uh, terror th threats that are coming upon churches right now to have cities in North Carolina have on their books, sorry, no church zone. I and mean, they weren't even allowed to lease space in this area. So it wasn't even just about purchasing commercial use space. Uh, I'm glad the ACLJ is here. I'm glad we're able to provide that kind of uh, legal work. And again, it's it's quick. We're able to get it done. You've heard some cases here, like the Pastor Saw case. It could take seven years. Yeah, sure. uh, but then you have some that can take two weeks and get stuff done. And again, no or less, none of them are less important than the other. So if you think you have one of these issues, all you have to do, I mean, we will tell you yes or no. We'll tell you if they, we can't do anything, but likely we can. Go to aclj.org, like I said, slash help, and just go on the website, play around, see what we got there. We got an amazing work going on there, amazing media presence. So you have all these great articles and blogs and resources. A lot of times you can just go straight to a lawyer. We also provide you with great documentation for you to take. Uh, to you. If you don't want to quite get to that level, maybe you want to you know, start slow, yeah. work your way up to you know suing your employer or something like that. If you don't want to do that right off the bat, we can provide you with the papers and the details that you need to say, no, I have these rights. Right. And as of right now, you also could really use your prayers. We've launched our latest all new ACLJ prayer guide at aclj.org slash pray. These come out every few months. We have seen Tens of thousands of people download these prayer guides. It's really amazing. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you can scan it or on Rumble, scan it on your screen. Uh, you could do that, and it'll take you straight to it. But we also want to give back to those who become ACLJ champions. Those have decided they're going to give on a monthly basis. For those, you're actually going to get a special version of the prayer guide, a little more curated content to pray for the specific battles, because we know that not only do you support the work of the ACLJ, you are taking it one step forward when you just say, I want to give monthly, because these are the issues that I care about you can get that special aclj champions prayer guide right now go to aclj.org also we're in the middle of our life and liberty drive so all donations are doubled they're matched they're ready for you right there all you gotta do make a donation essentially twenty dollars becomes forty dollars and so on and so forth up we appreciate it we'll be right back with second half hour seculo this is our short break so don't go anywhere less than a minute and we'll be right back The ACLJ fights the battles that matter most to our members. We listen to you, and we're taking action through the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. Every dime we receive goes to defend life and liberty, from Capitol Hill to Geneva to the United Nations. Now is the time to fight. The rights to life and liberty are the cornerstones of our constitutional republic, but they are under attack. That is why we're proud to announce the return of the ACLJ Life and and Liberty Drive. This month, we're redoubling our efforts to beat back the radical left's attacks on your constitutional freedoms and to defend the sanctity of human life, not just here at home, but around the world. Every gift you give will be doubled dollar for dollar, doubling your impact for life and liberty. Go to aclj.org right now 
and help us. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. All right, we got calls coming in. 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. Uh, both involving President Trump's uh, legal issues. So uh, let's take both these calls, Logan. We can go first to Renee in Arizona on line four. Hey, Renee. Hi. I'm just wondering... I'm just wondering how anything Jack Smith is doing is constitutional. This is out, so outside the purview of what our forefathers thought or put in place, it's not funny. Well, how I is think that? that is a challenge that is being put forward in court. Uh, that's why he's even having to go over the issue. And, Logan, this is an important point on this immunity case, that he's even having to do this case before the U.S. Supreme Court, of all places, that they are going to weigh in. Because what he is trying to do is somewhat new. So he is pushing the line of what the Department of Justice has tried to do in the past. So this time it's a former president, and they want to prosecute for uh, official acts as president. So if you officially as president believe the election was stolen, and you say something about it, and they believe that you're doing that because you are trying to steal the election, not because you actually believe. So they're saying even if it's an official act, you can be prosecuted as a criminal when you become the former president. That is what they're putting forward here. That is why ultimately I think you see the Supreme Court is taking the case, Renee, because this is a new way of pushing that line, Logan, and it would, it would be a line push that would change for future fu future presidents would have to make decisions differently if this case goes uh, the way it could against President Trump. So you really have to, if you're a judge, you've got to really sit there, even if you're on the left, and imagine that if you do this, this also happens to your favorite liberal presidents as well, and they can be much more, more easily prosecuted for f official acts. So these are duly elected presidents of the United States uh, as taking acts that the Department of Justice believes were criminal, because of what? What was in his mind at the time? Which didn't you have to really get into intent? Did President Trump really have an intent to steal an election? Or did he believe, truthfully, that the election was being stolen? Thus, he could officially take actions as president to make sure that it wouldn't be. Who gets to make the policy decision on that? I think it's the President of the United States, not the Department of Justice, even if they strongly dis disagree with the conclusion of the President of the United States. Let's go ahead and take the next call. Let's go to Kim, who's calling on line three, watching on YouTube, which we appreciate. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that thumbs up. We really appreciate it. And subscribe if you haven't. Kim, welcome. Hi. My hey, question is, I just wanted to know if the Supreme Court grants Trump immunity, what cases go away? So the Florida case involving uh, the confidential records, would, would go, all of Jack Smith's cases would go away. So any federal cases, remember what the Supreme Court is looking at is specifically uh, whether a former president is subject to f uh, federal criminal prosecution, federal. So what doesn't go away necessarily? The state case in Georgia and the New York DA case, and, and potentially uh, Letitia James as well. So you've got three cases. You've got the New York AG, the New York District Attorney, and, of course, the, the Atlanta district attorney, those cases would not necessarily be affected by this case automatically. Could they have some influence on whether or not the state could do this as well? Absolutely. But the cases that would go away immediately are the cases involving January 6th and the cases involving uh, the, the classified records, the Jack Smith crim federal criminal prosecutions of former President Trump. That's right. Hey, we'll be back in just a minute here. I want to tell you, obviously, support the work of the ACLJ during the Life and Liberty Drive. In our next segment, we're going to discuss the FBI and how they arrested an 18-year-old in Idaho for a very violent, specific plot to attack churches on behalf of ISIS. We told you this would happen again. You would have these threats happening. I know a lot of people saw uh, the threats that, or the statements that went out about elevated threats, and I think we know now what one of them specifically was. We're going to break that down in the next segment, as well as take all your phone calls, whether it's about religious freedom, whether it's about safety in churches. I'd love to hear from you about that. 1-800-684-3110. 1-800-684-3110. If you're watching right now on any of our platforms, 
We still would love for to hear from you. We'd love for you to call in. We'll be back in just a moment on Secular. Iran is now saying for a ceasefire, we'll call off any kind of attacks in response uh, to what happened to our IG, IRGC uh, leaders. One, would you trust them with any kind of offer like this? And two, do you think it's even a legitimate offer? Because we've seen the ceasefires they've wanted, and they've been very different ceasefires than the United States has agreed to, especially at the congressional level or at uh, at the Israeli level in their, uh, in their uh, government as well. Look, I, you and I have talked about this before. The first step is to get the hostages back. Uh, talking about a ceasefire uh, without the return of all the hostages, including American hostages, by the way, uh, I, I think is a, is a waste of time. So what is what is Iran saying? We we want a ceasefire and we want to keep the hostages. We want to use them for negotiations later. No, the first and only conversation is when and where are you returning the hostages? All of the other conversations about rebuilding and leadership in the Palestinian territories and who should be a part of it, all of those conversations are after you get the hostages returned home safely. We know Iran has the leverage over Hamas to say, send these people home. And guess what's going to happen? A lot less civilian loss, a lot less attacks, and uh, and maybe we get to see rise up amongst this this group in the Gaza Strip to say, you know what, it's not worth going through this every five years to have our entire cities destroyed, our families disrupted. We need to do something different. You have to demand that the hostages be released. That's what Israel is doing right now, Jordan. They are trying to find the hostages. They're having to go hunt for them because Hamas is hiding them. All right, welcome back to Secular. We are taking your calls, too, at 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. There's been alerts that went out over the last, was it the last couple of weeks, Logan? Yeah. yeah, there were some even, there were, well, after the attack in Russia from ISIS-K, there were threats that, there would be almost retaliation, even lone wolf kind of attacks. And they yeah. even said those specifically. They may be not directly connected, but they may have specific threats. And a lot of them... This is necessarily reconstituted at a level that we've seen since the, uh, the killing of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and the fall of the ISIS right. caliphate. different. But, but they, there have been the ISIS-K attacks like in Afghanistan. Yeah, and they made statements uh, specifically saying to watch out in America. This came over the weekend, uh, you know, heading out of Easter, what was right. you know, the Easter or the week before and saying, hey, some of this stuff may this start a week before. happening. And now uh, we're seeing some arrests being made. This has yeah, happened. Interesting. In, you know, again, this starts to kind of pl- feel like the old playbook, which is an 18-year-old. Yeah. A lot of times they were preyed on Midwestern kids, an 18-year-old in Idaho yeah. who you know, essentially was planning violent attacks on behalf of ISIS, according to the Justice Department. We actually have um, a statement fairly recently yeah. From Chris Ray, a conversation or a conversation was said his hearing uh, between Chris Ray and Marco Rubio that kind of gives you a better better idea of what we're dealing with here yeah, like, uh, is, domestically. It's still like really a threat because we don't even hear, you only hear the name really. I, you hear about it. The one attack on our troops was ISIS K, was Afghanistan, mm-hmm. and then again now in Russia. And you heard about it in Russia, and you kind of wonder is that really ISIS? Yeah. And then then you start seeing about ISIS recruiting online, which is what they kind of did here as we get to this story. But the first is like, well, how do they get here? You know, how who, who you know, is ISIS really in the United States? Take a listen to the FBI Director Christopher Ray when he's asked about it uh, last month at a U.S. Senate hearing by Senator Rubio. There is a particular network um, that uh, has uh, where some of the overseas facilitators of the smuggling network have ISIS ties uh, that we're very concerned about, uh, and that we've been spending an enormous amount of effort with our partners investigating. Um, uh, exactly what that network is up to uh, is something that's, again, the subject of our current investigation. But so there is a network we're concerned about that has facilitators involved in it that have ties to ISIS Correct. and terrorist organizations. Correct. Okay, so you've got, Logan, confirmation there that from yeah, the FBI right. that there are organizations and networks utilizing our, our open, open borders, if you want to call it that, the southern border, 
uh, to, to be part of smuggling operations, which could also include smuggling in ISIS fighters. Yeah, I, mean, that, I have a feeling, though this is the one that's public, uh, that this is happening all the time right now that we're seeing it. There wouldn't be these nationwide alerts to be careful. Uh, you know, my, my kids went to a Christian music concert the other night. At, at the same time as they were going downtown, I'm getting an alert on my phone saying, if you're going to large gatherings, particularly of religious things, it may not be the best right now. So your mind obviously goes to situations like this. I am thankful that uh, the FBI maybe did their job for once and uh, went in there and actually yeah. got someone and were actually paying attention to what was happening. The interesting is, this is an 18-year-old kid in Idaho uh, that we know yeah. that they were uncovering his quote. This is what they said. Truly horrific and violent plot. He was going to attack churches in Coeur in Idaho. Uh, this past weekend on behalf of ISIS. So, I mean, they have very specifics. Where, I mean, the kid, uh, they name him. I mean, because he's now facing charges. So that's what's different than when they catch them here in the United States and they, they, they were able to, un- they are able to uncover his specific plot where he was going to target. Um, and again, I think yeah, we all realize, Sunday. we all realize now, uh, just like in the rest of the world, uh, places of worship, uh, especially churches, if it's a uh, Christian, uh, Christian holiday, synagogues, anytime it's a Jewish holiday, uh, because of these mass protest efforts we've also seen it since the war in Gaza, since the attacks on October 7th, Logan. I mean, there is a lot more radical activity going they on. Of, they put a lot of details out so you have a good idea. I, mean, I am surprised. We usually this early don't get that much about, a lot. about who this is. Now, what good news that might be is that that's it. Usually you don't get more details because you don't want to identify, you don't want the other people who might be part of the plot to know that their plot has been. Yeah, essentially they said he was interacting with people online, posting social media content, clearly someone not in their right mind, posting this situation uh, and and saying they had pledged their uh, support to ISIS and terrorist organizations. His attack involved using flame-covered weapons, explosives, knives, a machete, a pipe, and ultimately firearms. His plans grew more precise, and he eventually identified a specific church and date on which he planned to attack, which does beg the question, how do you feel currently in your places of worship? I am curious. I know that, like, I can't go into a movie theater. I can't go into a concert without at least, you know, keeping your eyes out, knowing where the exit signs are, knowing where things, and it's a sad state where we're in that, but it's just security and police in those kind of places now. Yeah. yeah obviously, we saw, uh, we've seen shootings at places of worship recently. I'd love to hear from you, 1-800-684-3110. Uh, you, know, you don't want to live in a spirit of fear. We don't want to have that be what we have to do in our places of worship. We also so want to have our eyes open heading into these, uh, especially now, just recently getting so out of the Easter holiday. When went out, um, I know that both of my kids' schools got additional security for that week. Yeah. Leading up uh, because of that threat from the FBI. Now, what it, they already had additional security because of a school shooting last year. Mm-hmm. And so it was already up the security to another level, which was pretty high. And but they changed all their security levels, and then they brought in more security because of that FBI threat. I'm glad that the schools are responding to those to those FBI notices, and they're not necessarily having to cancel because these aren't you know they didn't put out one that was specific. They didn't yeah. say like you know obviously. Um, I this churches uh, should also just yes, keep an eye out as well, though. Well, I mean, and a lot of these schools are connected to so, the church as well. It's, and, and you've got kind of dual security going on. Yeah, you know, and as we know, the FBI has been fixated, it seems like, on a lot of other things. So right. The fact they actually have a, a force out I there doing this. I think that they've this. seen the, the, the protest in the streets in the United States uh, for Hamas. And you realize that that kind of protest, when you have that many people willing people, to support Hamas, there's going to be a sm- I'm not saying most of them, but there's going to be a smaller group of people within that group who may be the kind of people exactly that ISIS would want to target online to radicalize, to do something yes, violent, you're of course. You're able to uh, propagandize large groups of young people uh, to, to take to the streets. You're right. that There's a, certainly a percentage of those young people who are vulnerable and can be taken even more advantage of uh, in terms of what they're going to try to get them to do. And that was clear in this situation. He was arrested and taken care of. But it is uh, another threat that's going on. Um, again, I would like to hear from you, though, 1-800-684-3110. We've got Lee in Virginia on line one. Hey, Lee, welcome to Secular. You're on the air. Thank you. I have a question slash comment concerning the uh, the executive branch and how the executive branch can be prosecuted. 
from my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems to me that the Constitution provides the way to uh, prosecute an executive through the impeachment clause that the president is a rep- my representative, but it also the representation in Congress is also the person who checks that that body, that person in particular, the executive branch being the president. How can it be that some bureaucrat from Washington, D.C., who I never voted for, that nobody even knows, could just crawl out of the woodwork and start making prosecutions against a president when the country has already rendered a decision either to elect this person or not elect this person? Because likewise, another person, a prosecutor, could come from Kansas and say, Joe Biden opened the border and let fentanyl into our community, and I'm going to go and prosecute him because we had a death well, in our community. Say to that, well, that's his policy. See, their argument there would be he, you know, his policy was to shift resources. It wasn't that he legally opened the border. He just shifted resources to a different view. So, again, a lot of this is how you interpret the Constitution, how far you've let it go. I do agree with you. I think that executive officials, there's one way to deal with presidents. You can impeach them. And then you can remove them from office. You can also do that with other uh, uh, other officials who are appointed by the president, so the cabinet members. I mean, you could you have a lot of power in Congress if you really do believe that the entire administration is full of bad actors. And if you do it, they can never hold office again. And by the way, it doesn't always prevent them from being prosecuted for crimes they have, may have committed while in that office because you stripped them of that office. So here's where it gets unique, though. Former. So when you're current president, I think I, I, most people agree, unless it's a civil matter outside of the presidency, it has nothing to do with official act. But uh, official acts of a former president, this is something very unique. And so this is why the Supreme Court has taken up this very question of can a former president be prosecuted for official acts that a prosecutor believes – they could convince a jury that that president violated uh, a valid law of the United States when they engaged in that act. That's right. Hey, we're headed towards our final segment of the show today. We'd love to hear from you. We've got about three lines open right now. 1-800-684-3110. If you ever want to hear your voice on the radio, give your opinion, it's the time to do it. 1-800-684-3110. If you're watching on social media, we encourage you to call in as well. Uh, and, of course... We are in our ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. And like I said, if you become an ACLJ champion today, you're going to get the special version of the prayer guide. Our new ACLJ prayer guide is available to everyone at no cost at aclj.org slash pray. But there's a mere curated version specifically for those who are ACLJ champions because we know that you guys are in it for the long haul, are in it to support our work and to really vigorously pray. And I please encourage you to do that at aclj.org slash pray. We'll be right back. This, again, it seems to go to this point of, is the administration, because I mean, I mean, reading into this, what we're seeing is Israel is being blamed for this uh, potential for an Iranian attack. So now that if, if you target Iran as a terrorist state and you target any of their actors, which uh, you've been in an administration that did as well, that somehow it's your fault uh, that Iran is, is a terrorist state and that you're provoking them and that it's, it's Israeli's fault that they, you know, I guess that October 7th occurred. We're never going to convince the left wing uh, types and the media types who, who just always want to blame America and blame Israel. But the reality is, is in the Trump administration, we had Iran uh, without money. We froze all of their um, assets. There were sanctions on them. There were worldwide pressure and it was working. And in the Biden administration, they decided to uh, open up the sanctions, open up ca- cash and credit to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. And now we're in a position where all of that money that was unleashed by Joe Biden is being used against America and America's allies in the form of war. We would not have had October 7th, 181 days ago, if Joe Biden had not funded uh, this Iranian regime who then went out and started funding all their their terrorist proxy groups. Yeah, yeah. Much better resources, much better capabilities. And and then, uh, of course, the, and also knew that they could – uh, they were willing to carry out an attack like this and suffer the repercussions. I mean, they talk about, of course, you know, how horrible things are in Gaza, but they knew what would happen if they carried out an attack that extreme. What has happened is, is the foreign policy rational thinkers have been shoved aside, and the political people 
are making the decisions. The political people who care about Michigan and Detroit and want to win an election, so everything is political, those are the people who are calling the shots on, on Israel right now. All right, one 800 Talking about the issue of church security. This is because specifically FBI has arrested an 18-year-old in Idaho. And, again, they, we don't often get a lot of info unless they feel like this was the person who's going to do it. They weren't part of, like, maybe a larger network. And that's usually why you don't get a lot of info is they don't want the other net people in the network to know that they're on to them or to know who in their network may have been uh, already captured by the FBI or in the FBI's crosshairs. But in this case, they decided to let us know. It's an 18-year-old. Um, his name was Alexander. His name is Alexander Mercurio. He is charged with a truly horrific and, quote, violent plot to attack churches in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, uh, over this past weekend on behalf of the Islamic State. So ISIS still uh, attempting to recruit online. And we talked about, again, the idea of uh, church uh, security as well. Uh, here at the ACLJ, and we've yeah you know, we talked about our our security at the ACLJ, uh, where we take it very seriously, um, and we take it obviously we talked about our kids' schools, which are our Christian schools, sometimes they're connected to churches. They take it very seriously, um, and I think we're seeing a movement right now that's fairly radical in the streets that we didn't even see during nine eleven. I mean, it wasn't like people took to the streets after nine eleven were like, yeah, I support uh, uh, Al Qaeda. Not in America, no. Around the world, maybe. Around the world, yeah, but, but not, not, like in, not on college camps. No, not as much then. But what we are seeing is that after those horrific attacks on Jews in Israel, October 7th. Maybe against the Dixie Chicks. We saw a lot it. of people take to the streets, as they are now, in support of Hamas. And if you imagine, if you're a group like ISIS, you would say, I bet not all those people, but maybe some of those, would be the kind of people we could take to the next level. We could radicalize some of these people. They're looking to do the next level of violence, which, again, there's a big difference between peaceful protests, which you can have a right to do, and dissent, uh, which I could strongly disagree with you and still say you have a right to do, and then uh, planning violent acts uh, like this official did. But what it also reminds you, Logan, is that Islamic extremism is still a real issue. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and take some phone Inside calls. Inside the U.S. we got a lot coming in. Let's go to James, who's watching on Rumble, line three. Thanks to all our Rumblers. We appreciate them. Say hi, Rumble. You're on the air, James. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I was just calling in, mentioning that we went ahead and our church for about the last five years has gone ahead, and uh, we have a select member of group of uh, churchgoers who have their, all have their CPLs. You wouldn't know it, but they're spread, spread throughout the congregation, and as soon as the service starts, all the doors are locked except for one door to keep an entry uh limited and uh just try to and we also installed all monitors on all the yep. doors and video cameras so we can listen it's sad it's I, it's not I, I think it's great that you have that we have it you know here in our office so i mean you have it but you know people yeah, well, you saw home, it is sad like... that you have to do that because a lot of churches i know Logan, like uh you know my church um uh, as well that has like a a smaller uh place of worship that kind of is supposed to be open almost 24 hours a day and and they, they, they now they have to like lock every door around and maybe they allow one door in and they tell you that's on camera but uh it's changed we used to be able to it's kind of like in europe walk right in uh, it was you know we looked at what would happen if you do have a plan like something that happened at the lakewood church shooting uh at joel osteen's church who i support and what you saw was they had a plan in place and when someone came in uh, they really mitigated that threat, and they really took care of it very quickly because they had a team of not just police officers. They had a lot of undercover people. They brought a lot of them out of the church service the next week and were able to handle that very quickly. So you do want to make sure you have those plans. It made us look at all of our security plans, make sure everyone is up to date and knowing it and, and being aware that we don't live in a perfect world by any means. Let's continue on. Let's go to Annabelle, who's calling California. Uh, listen on the radio, which we appreciate as well. Annabelle, welcome. Hi, Logan and Jordan, proud and grateful champion reporting for duty. You know, this country, as you're discussing, is in dire trouble, and the world's blowing up. It's astounding to me that I can tune in the ACLJ, hear Mike Pompeo, Rick Rennell, along with the unsurpassed experience and expertise of the ACLJ. By being a champion, I'm securing the armaments needed to fight for liberty, 
life and justice in my beloved country worldwide and for myself if needed. And I also feel a strong kinship with my fellow champions by being a part of a family of fighters. As a human being, I have a responsibility to try and uphold the rights of all. That is what drives the ACLJ in everything you guys do, and I pray for you daily. Thank you, Annabelle. Listen, I know most of our team from around the country, especially I know creative team, Logan, but I know our attorneys and our government affairs team, and they literally came to work the ACLJ to do that. I mean, that is what what that brought them here was either you know, religious liberty issues, freedom of speech issues. Uh, they care about the country. But they also care about the values this country can espouse around the world to enable others to experience the kind of freedom that most don't get to experience outside of the United States. And that is a cool thing about our ACLJ champions is that they get it. I mean, they get the full scope of the pe- the kind of people that we attract to work here. It's not it's not just a job. Uh, there's lots of jobs in Washington D.C. and there's lots of jobs around the city with nonprofits. But uh, in this job, you get to know what issues you're working on, and, and that's a, a very cool thing for our teams. Yep, absolutely. We're gonna take a couple more calls. Let's go to Tara, who's calling in New York on line one, watching on YouTube. Welcome. Hi, guys. Um, I really appreciate you. I'm a Nova champion. Um, love supporting you guys. So I'm on the opposite side. I'm, I'm really frustrated, actually. I'm part of my church's security team, and I've tried to get them to, you know, get some training, to let's have a plan. Like, there's honestly zero plan um, to handle anything if something happens um, within our church. We're a relatively large church, and um, I'm beyond frustrated. You know, most of us yeah. do have our CCW, but that's about it. It's just We've had issues uh, with New York, too. There might be I, – I, don't always – I'm not saying your church leadership's right or wrong. We've been finding out issues, though, in New York State over over these security yeah, I issues. I understand if it was – she said she's in a big church. I understand if you're a small church, you may not have the money to do it. You may have not – a lot of people volunteer, though. Well, that's uh, what we've had issues with in New York, with, which is people with their concealed carry permits not being allowed to volunteer. And so and so we've been fighting those in court. So, uh, people sometimes forget the Second Amendment is also an issue we work on at the ACLJ. It is, especially when it involves church security or religion or places of worship, even uh, synagogues there. And that is an issue we've worked on. And, and there are some blue states, I will tell you. I'm not trying to blame them for anything that happens there, but there are some blue states that make it tougher, a lot tougher, for these churches to put in the kind of security that they would like to do so it's easier for the church not even to mess with the regulations. And that, that I don't think, again, I think enough's happened in our country to say let the churches do what they need to do. Yep, absolutely. I you're doing it out, feel of, the out same of, way. of bad action. Hey, we only got a minute and a half left, and I just want to spend that time to, one, thank you if you become an ACLJ supporter or if you become an ACLJ champion during this broadcast. I really appreciate it. If you did become an ACLJ champion, you can be able to download this ACLJ champion prayer guide. If you're not, though, we also just have it available, the regular standard version. It is available absolutely at no cost at aclj.org slash pray. Again, aclj.org slash pray. It's our ACLJ prayer guide. helps you lead you through how to pray for the organization, pray for our biggest issues, for our leaders in this country. It's really a beautiful piece. I'd love for you to take a look at it. And not only take a look at it, I'd love for you to engage. I'd love for you to pray for us because we can feel it and we need it. We can't do this without you. So not only if you can support us financially, great. I, I obviously appreciate that. And all donations are doubled right now during this Life and Liberty Drive. But even stronger, even more important, please pray for us each and every day. You have no idea how much it means to us. Uh, just simply take a moment out of your day. Pray for the ACLJ. Even if you're not using that prayer guide, I encourage you to. It's free. It's a great little uh, piece to really help you through a lot of our topics here, what you can pray for specifically. But I encourage you to do that as well. We'll be back tomorrow. If you are new on YouTube or new on Rumble or on Facebook, however you watch this, make sure you subscribe. We do this broadcast each and every day and put up a lot of great content throughout our channels, our social media channels, and at aclj.org. We will talk to you tomorrow.